Chapter 9 Letty's mother was prodding the huge fireplace with a poker, pushing the burning logs together. Old Mrs. Hoopstock was stirring a bulbous pot on the stove with a large wooden spoon. She lifted the spoon to her mouth, blew on it theatrically, sipped from it, pursed her lips, and then added a pinch of something and a fistful of something else to it. She turned down the flame and then looked at me, from my wet hair to my bare feet, which were blue and cold. As I stood there, a puddle began to appear on the flagstone floor around me, and the drips of water around my dressing gown splashed onto it. Hot bath, said old Mrs. Hempstock, or he'll catch his death. That's what I said, said Letty. Letty's mother was already hauling a tin from beneath the kitchen table and filling it with steaming water from the enormous black kettle that hung above the fireplace. Pots of cold water were added until she pronounced it the perfect temperature. Right, in you go, said old Mrs. Hempstock. Hempstock. Spit spot. I looked at her, horrified. Was I going to have to undress in front of people I didn't know? We'll wash your clothes and dry them for you and mend that dressing gown, said Letty's mother. She took the dressing gown from me and took the kitten, which I had barely realized I was still holding, and then she walked away. As quickly as possible, I shed my red nylon pajamas. The bottoms were soaked, and the legs were now ragged and ripped and would never be whole again. I dipped my finger into the water and then climbed in and sat down on the tin floor of the bath and reassured in that reassuring kitchen in front of a huge fire. I leaned back in the hot water. My feet began to throb as they came back to life. I knew that naked was wrong, but the hip stops seemed indifferent to my nakedness. Letty was gone in my pajamas and dressing gown with her. Her mother was getting out knives, forks, spoons, little jugs and bigger jugs, carving knives and wooden trenchers and arranging them onto a table. Old Mrs. Hempstock passed me a mug filled with soup from the black pot above the stove. Get that down, ya. Heat you up from the inside first. The soup was rich and warming. I had never drunk soup in the bath before. It was a perfectly new experience. When I finished the mug, I gave it back to her, and in return she passed me a large cake of white soap and a face flannel and said, Now get scrubbing. Rub the life and the warmth back into your bones. She sat down on the rocking chair on the other side of the fire and rocked gently, not looking at me. I felt safe. It was as if the essence of grandmotherliness had been condensed into that one place, that one time. I was not at all afraid of Ursula Monkton, whatever she was. Not then. Not there. Young Mrs. Hempstock opened the oven door and took out a pie in its shiny, crusty brown and glistening, and put it on the window ledge to cool. I dried myself off with the towel they brought me, and the fire's heat drying me as much as the towel did. Then Letty Hempstock returned and gave me a voluminous white thing like a girl's nightdress but made of white cotton with long arms, and the shirt that draped to the floor and a white cap. I hesitated to put it on until I realized what it was. A nightgown. I had seen pictures of them in books. Wee Willie Winky ran through the town wearing one in every book of nursery rhymes I had ever owned. I slipped into it. The nightcap was too big for me and I fell down over my face, and Letty took it away at once. Dinner was wonderful. There was a joint of beef with roast potatoes, golden, crisp on the outside and soft and white on the inside. Buttered greens I did not recognize, although I think now that they might have been nettles. Roasted carrots all blackened and sweet. I didn't think that I liked cooked carrots, so I nearly didn't eat one, but I was brave and I tried it and I liked it. And I was disappointed in boiled carrots for the rest of my childhood. For dessert there was the pie, stuffed with apples and with swollen raisins and crushed nuts, all topped with thick yellow custard, creamier and richer than anything I had ever tasted at school or at home. The kitten slept on a cushion beside the fire until the end of the meal when it joined a fog-colored house cat four times its size in a meal of scraps of meat. While we ate, nothing was said about what happened to me or why I was there. The Hempstock ladies talked about the farm. There was the door to the milking shed needed a new coat of paint. A cow named Rhiannon, who looked to be getting lame in her left hind leg, the path to be cleared on the way that led down to the reservoir. Is it just the three of you? I asked. Aren't there any men? <laughs> men! hooted old Mrs. Hempstock. I don't know what blessed good a man would be. Nothing a man could do around this farm. I can't do twice as fast and five times as well. Letty said, We've had men here sometimes. They come and they go. Right now it's just us. Her mother nodded. Ah, they went off to seek their fate and fortune, mostly the male Hempstocks. There's never any keeping them here when the call comes. They get a distant look in their eyes, and then we've lost them good and proper. Next chance they get, they're off to towns and even cities, and nothing but an occasional postcard to even show they were here at all. Old Mrs. Hempstock said, His parents are coming. They're driving here. They just passed Parm's elm tree. Badger saw them. Is she with them? I asked. Ursula Monkton. 
Her? said old Mrs. Hempstock, amused. That thing? Not her. I thought about it for a moment. They will make me go back with them, and then she'll lock me in the attic and let my daddy kill me when he, she gets bored. She said so. Oh, she may have told you that, ducks, said Letty's mother. But she ain't going to do it. Or anything like it, or my name's not Jenny Hepstock. I liked the name Jenny, but I didn't believe her, and I wasn't reassured. Soon the door to the kitchen would open, and my father would shout at me, or he would wait until we got into the car, and he would shout at me then, and then they would take me back up the lane to the house, and I would be lost. Let's see, said Jenny Hepstock. We could be away when they get here. They could arrive last Tuesday when there's nobody home. Out of the question, said the old woman. Just complicates things, playing with time. We could turn the boy into something else so that they'd never find him. Look how as hard as they might. I blinked. Was that even possible? I wanted to be turned into something. The kitten had, had finished its portion of potato scraps. Indeed, it seemed to have eaten more than the house cat. And now it leapt into my lap and began to wash itself. Jenny Hempstock got up and went to the, out of the room. I wondered where she was going. We can't turn him into anything, said Letty, clearing the table at last of the plates and cutlery. His parents will get frantic. And if they're being controlled by the police, she'll just feed the franticness. Next thing you know, we'll have the police dragging the west of and looking for him, or worse, the ocean. The kitten lay down on my lap and curled up, wrapped around itself until it was nothing more than a flattened circlet of fluffy black fur. It closed its vivid blue eyes, the color of an ocean, and it slept and it purred. Well, said old Mrs. Hempstock, what do you suggest then? Letty thought, pushing her lips together, moving them over to one side. Her head tipped, and I thought she was running through alternatives. Then her face brightened. Oh, snip and cut, she said. Old Mrs. Hempstock sniffed. Ah, you're a good girl. I'm not saying you're not, but snippage. Well, you couldn't do that, not yet. You have to cut the edges out exactly, sew them back without seams showing. What would you cut out? The flea won't let you snip her. She's not in the fabric. She's outside of it. Jenny Hepstock returned. She was carrying my old dressing gown. I put it through the mangle, but it's still a little damp. That'll be the edges sharper to line up. You don't want to sew needlework when it's still damp. She put the dressing gown down on the table in front of the old Mrs. Hempstock, and then she pulled out from the front pocket of her apron an old pair of scissors, black and gold, a long needle and a spool of red thread. Rowanberry and red thread stop a witch in her speed, I recited. It was something I had read in the book. That work and work well, said Letty, if there was any witches involved in all this, but there's not. Old Mrs. Hempstock was examining my dressing gown. It was brown and faded with a sort of sapia tartan across it. It had been a present of my father's parents, my grandparents, several birthdays ago, when it had been comically big on me. Probably, she said, as if she were talking to herself, it would be best if your father was happy for you to stay the night here. But for that to happen, they couldn't be angry with you or even worried. The black scissors were in her hand and already snip snipping, and then, when I heard a knock on the front door and Jenny Hempstock got up to answer it, she went into the hall and closed the door behind her. Don't let them take me, I said to Letty. Hush, she said, I'm working here. While grandmother's snipping, you just be sleepy and at peace. Happy. I was far from happy, and not in the slightest bit sleepy. Letty leaned across the table and she took my hand. Don't worry, she said. And with that, the door opened, and my father and my mother were in the kitchen. I wanted to hide, but the kid had shifted reassuringly on my lap, and Letty smiled at me, a reassuring smile. Uh, we're looking for our son, my father was telling Mrs. Hempstock, and we have reason to believe. And even as he was saying that, my mother was striding toward me. Here he is, darling, we were worried silly. You're in a lot of trouble, young man, said my father. Snip, 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 went the black scissors and the irregular section of fabric that old Mrs. Hempstock had been cutting fell onto the table. My parents froze. They stopped talking, stopped moving. My father's mouth was still open. My mother stood on one leg, as unmoving as if she were a shopping window dummy. What? What did you do to them? I was unsure whether or not I ought to be upset. Jenny Hempstock said, Oh, they're fine. Just a little snipping, then a little sewing. It'll be good as gold. She reached down to the table, pointed to the scrap of folded dressing gown tartan resting upon it. That's your dad and you in the hallway, and that's the bathtub. She sniffed that out. So without any of that, there's no reason for Daddy to be angry with you. I hadn't told them about the bathtub, and did not wonder how she knew. Now the old woman was threading the needle, and with the red thread, she sighed theatrically. 
Old eyes, old eyes, she said. But she licked the tip of the thread and pushed it through the eye of the needle without any apparent difficulty. Letty, you'll need to know what his toothbrush looks like, said the old woman. She began to sew the edges of the dressing gown together with tiny, careful stitches. What's your toothbrush look like? asked Letty quickly. It's green, bright green, a sort of appley green. It's not very big, just a green toothbrush my size. I wasn't describing it very well, I knew, and I pictured it in my head and tried to find something more about it that I could describe to set it apart from all other toothbrushes. No good. I imagined it, saw it in my mind's eye with the other toothbrushes in its red and white spotted beaker above the bathroom sink. Got it, said Letty. Nice job. Very nearly done here, said old Mrs. Hempstock. Jenny Hempstock smiled, a huge smile, and it lit her up, up her ruddy old face. Old Mrs. Hempstock picked up the scissors and snipped the final time, and a fragment of thread fell to the tabletop. My mother's foot came down. She took a step, and then she stopped. My father said, Oh? Uh? Jenny said, Oh, and it made our Letty so happy that your boy would come here and stay the night. It's a bit old-fashioned here, I'm afraid. The old woman said, We've got an inside Levy nowadays. I don't know how much more modern anybody would be. Outside lavies and chamber pots were good enough for me. He ate a fine meal, said Jenny. Didn't you? There was pie, I told my parents, for dessert. My father's brow was creased. He looked confused. Then he put his hand into the pocket of his car coat and pulled out something long and green with toilet paper wrapped around the top. You forgot your toothbrush? I thought you'd want it. Now, if he wants to come, if now, if he wants to come home, he can come home, my mother said to Jenny Hempstock. He went to stay the night at Kovaxia's house a few months ago, and by nine he was calling us to come and get him. Christopher Kovacs was two years older and, had, and a head taller than me, and he lived with his mother at a large cottage opposite the entrance to our lane, by the old green water tower. His mother was divorced. I liked her. She was funny and drove a VW Beetle, the first I had ever seen. Christopher owned many books I had not read and was a member of the Puffin Club. I could read his Puffin books, but only if I went to his house. He would never let me borrow them. There was a bunk bed in Christopher's bedroom, although he was an only child. I was given the bottom bunk, and the night I stayed there, once I was in bed and Christopher Kovac's mother had said goodnight to us, she had turned out the bedroom light and closed the door. He leaned down and began squirting me with a water pistol he hidden beneath his pillow. I didn't know what to do. This isn't like when I went to Christopher Kovac's house, I told my mother, embarrassed. I like it here. What are you wearing? She stared at my wee willy winky nightgown in puzzlement. Jenny said, oh, we had a little accident. He was wearing that while his pajamas are drying. Oh, I see, said my mother. Well, good night, dear. Have a nice time with your new friend. She peered down at Letty. What's your name again, dear? Letty, said Letty Hempstock. Is it short for Letitia? asked my mother. I knew a Letitia when I was at university. Of course, everybody called her Lettuce. Letty just smiled and did not say anything at all. My father put my toothbrush down on the table in front of me. I unwrapped the toilet paper around the head. I was, unmistakably, my green toothbrush. Under his car coat, my father was wearing a clean white shirt and no tie. I said, thank you. So, said my mother, what time should we buy to pick him up in the morning? Jenny smiled even wider. Oh, let you'll bring him back to you. Oh, we should give you some t time to play tomorrow morning. Now, before you go, I baked some scones for a this afternoon. And she put some scones into a large paper bag, which my mother took politely, and Jenny ushered her and my father out of the door. I held my breath until I heard the sound of the rover driving away, back up the lane. What did you do to them? I asked. And then, is this really my toothbrush? That, said old Mrs. Hemstoff with satisfaction in her voice, was a very respectable job of snipping and stitching, if you ask me. She held up my dressing gown. I couldn't see where she had removed a piece, nor where she had stitched it up. It was seamless. The mend invisible. She passed me the scrap of fabric on the table that she had cut. Here's your evening. You can keep it if you wish, but if I were you, I'd burn it. The rain pattered against the window, and the wind rattled to the window frames. I picked up the jagged-edged sliver of cloth. It was damp. I got up, waking the kitten, who sprang off my lap and vanished into the shadows. I walked over to the fireplace. If I burn this, I asked them, will it have really happened? Will my daddy have pushed me down into the bath? Will I forget it ever happened? Jenny Hempstock was no longer smiling. Now she looked concerned. What do you want? she asked. I want to remember, because it happened to me, and I'm still me. I threw the little scrap of cloth into the fire. 
There was a crackle, and the cloth smoked, and then it began to burn. I was under the water. I was holding my father's tie. I thought he was going to kill me. I screamed. I was lying on the flagstone floor of the Hempstock's kitchen, and I was rolling and screaming. My foot felt like I had trodden barefoot on a burning cinder, and the pain was intense. There was another pain, too, deep inside my chest. More distance, not a sharp. Discomfort, not a burning. Jenny was beside me. It's wrong. My foot, it's on fire. It hurts so much. She examined it, then licked her fingers, touched it to the hole in the sole of my foot from which I had pulled the worm two days before. There was a hissing sound, and the pain in my foot began to ease. I ain't never seen one of these before, said Jenny Hempstock. How did you get it? There was a worm inside me, I told her. That was how it came with us from the place from that orangey sky in, in my foot. And then I looked at Letty, who had crouched beside me, was now holding my hand, and I said, I brought it back. It was my fault. I'm sorry. Old Mrs. Hempstock was the last to reach me. She leaned over, pulled the sole of my foot up into the night. Nasty, she said, and very clever. She left the hole inside you so she could use it again. She could have hidden inside you if she needed to and used you at the door to go home. No wonder she wanted to keep you in the attic. So, let's strike while the iron's hot, as the, sol as the soldier said when he entered the laundry. She prodded the hole in my foot with her finger. It still hurt, but the pain had faded a little, and now it felt like a throbbing headache inside my foot. Something fluttered in my chest like a tiny maw, and then was still. Old Mrs. Hempstock said, Can you be brave? I didn't know. I didn't think so. It seemed to me that all I had done so far that night was run from things. The old woman was holding the needle she had used to sew up my dressing gown, and she grasped it now, not as if she were going to sew anything with it, but as if she were planning to stab me. I pulled my foot back. What are you going to do? I pulled my foot back. What are you going to do? Letty squeezed my hand. She's going to make the hole go away. I'll hold your hand. You don't have to look. Not if you don't want to. It'll hurt, I said. Stuff and nonsense, said the old woman. She pulled my foot towards her so the soul was facing her and stabbed the needle down. Not into my foot, I realized, but into the hole itself. It didn't hurt. Then she twisted the needle and pulled it back toward her. I watched, amazed. As something that glistened, it seemed black at first, then translucent and reflective like mercury, was pulled out from the sole of my foot on the end of the needle. I could feel it leaving my leg. The sensation seemed to travel all the way up inside, up my leg, through my groin and my stomach and into my chest. I felt it leave me with relief. The burning feeling abated, as did my terror. I watched old Mrs. Hempstock reel the thing in. I was still unable, somehow, to entirely make sense of what I was seeing. It was a hole with nothing around it, over two feet long, thinner than an earthworm, like the shed skin of a translucent snake. And then she stopped reeling it in. Doesn't want to come out, she said. It's holding on. There was a coldness in my heart, as if a chip of ice had lodged there. The old woman gave an expert look of the wrist, and then the glistening thing was dangling from her needle. I found myself thinking now, not of mercury but of the silvery slime trails that snails leave in the garden, and it no longer went into my foot. She let go of the sole and put my foot back. The tiny round hole had vanished completely as if it had never been there. Old Mrs. Hempstock cackled with glee. Ha! Thinks she's so clever, leaving her way home inside the boy. Is that clever? I don't think that's clever. I wouldn't give a tuppence for the lot of them. Jenny Hempstock produced an empty jam jar, and the old woman put the bottom of the dangling thing into it then raised the jar into a hole. At the end, she slipped the glistening invisible trail off the needle and put the lid in the jam jar with a decisive flick of her bony wrist. Ha! she said. And again, ha ha! Letty said, can I see it? She took the jam jar and held it up to the light. Inside the jar, the thing had begun lazily to uncurl. It seemed to be floating, as if the jar had been filled with water. It changed color as if caught the light in a different way sometimes sometimes black, sometimes silver. An experiment that I had found in a book of things boys could do, and which I had, of course, done. If you take an egg and blacken it completely with a soot from a candle flame, and then put it in a container filled with salt water, it will hang in the middle of the water, and it will seem to be silver. A peculiar, artificial silver that is only a trick of the light. I thought of that egg, then. 
Letty seemed fascinated. You're right. She left her way home inside him. No wonder she didn't want him to leave. I said, I'm sorry I let go of your hand, Letty. Oh, hush, she said. It's always too late for sorries, but I appreciate the sentiment. And next time you'll keep hold of my hand no matter what she throws at us. I nodded. The ice chip in my heart seemed to warm them and melt, and I began to feel whole and safe once more. So, said Jenny, we've got her way home, and we've got the boys safe. That's a good night's work, or I don't know what is. But she's got the boy's parents, said old Mrs. Hempstock, and his sister. We can't just leave her running around. Remember what happened in Cromwell's day, and before that, when Red Rufus was running around. Please attack varmints. She said it as if it were the natural law. That can wait until tomorrow, said Jenny. Now, Lenny. Letty. Yeah, yeah. That can wait until tomorrow. Now, Letty, take the lad and find a room for him to sleep in. He's had a long day. The black kitten was curled up in the rocking chair beside the fireplace. Can I bring the kitten with me? If you don't, she'll just come and find you. Jenny produced two candlesticks, the kind with big round handles, and each one with a shapeless mound of white wax in it. She lit a wooden taper from the kitchen fire, then transferred the flame from the taper, first to one candlestick and then to the other. She handed one candlestick to me and the other to Letty. Don't you have electricity? I asked. There were electric lights in the kitchen, big old-fashioned bulbs hanging from the ceiling, their filaments glowing. Not in that part of the house, said Letty. The kitchen's new. Sort of. Put your hand in front of your candles as you walk so it doesn't blow out. She cupped her own hand around the flame, and as she said this, and I copied her, and I walked behind her, the black kitten followed us up the kitchen through the wooden door painted white, down a step, and into the farmhouse. It was dark and our candles cast huge shadows, so it looked to me as we walked as if everything was moving, pushed and shaped by shadows, the grandfather clock and the stuffed animals and the birds. Were they stuffed, I wondered? Did that owl move, or was it just a flickering candle flame that made me think that it had turned its head as we passed? The hall table, the chairs, all of them moved in the candlelight, and all of them stayed perfectly still. We went up the seven stairs, and then up some steps, and we passed an open window. Moonlight spilled into the stairs, brighter than our candle flames. I glanced up through the window, and I saw the full moon. The cloudless sky was splashed with stars beyond all counting. That's the moon, I said. Gran likes it like that, said Letty Hempstock. But it was a crescent moon yesterday, and now it's full, and it was raining. It, it is raining, but now it's not. Oh, Gran always likes the full moon to shine on this side of the house. She says it's restful, and it reminds her when she was a girl. And it means you don't trip on the stairs. The kitten followed us up the stairs in a sequence of bounces. It made me smile. At the top of the house was Letty's room, and beside it another room, and it was this room that we entered. A fire blazed in the hearth, illuminating the rooms with orange and yellows. The room was warm and inviting. The bed had posts at each corner, and it had its own curtains. I had seen something like this in cartoons, but never in real life. There's clothes already set out for you to put on in the morning. I'll be asleep in the room next door if you want me. Just shout or knock if you need anything, and I'll come in. Gran said for you to use the inside lavatory, but it's a long way through the house, and you might get lost. So, if you need to do your business, there's a chamber pot under the bed, same as there's always been. I blew out my candle, which left the room illuminated by the fire in the hearth, and I pushed through the curtains and climbed up into the bed. The room was warm, but the sheets were cold as I got in them. The bed shook as something landed on it, and then small feet patted on the blankets in a warm, furry presence crushed itself into my face, and the kitten began softly to purr. There was, a, there was still a monster in my house, and, in a fragment of time that had, perhaps, been snipped out of reality, my father had pushed me into the water of a bath and tried, perhaps, to drown me. I had run for miles through the dark. I had seen my father kissing and touching the thing that called itself Ursula Moncton. The dread had not left my soul. But there was a kitten on my pillow, and it was purring in my face, and vibrantly, gently, with every purr, and very soon I slept.